bring your Bibles with me this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians, of course. We're starting a brand new chapter. We're going to be in chapter 6. So some of the most familiar verses uh, for every mother and every father found in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Remember as we begin this last great chapter of the book of Ephesians that we have been learning, uh, you know, how to walk worthy of the Lord. Amen? And walking worthy, equal in doctrine and equal in application. We're a hearer of God's word, not just a doer. I mean, a hearer and a doer of God's word. So that's how you walk worthy. That's how you have a balanced walk. So we've learned to imitate God as dear children, walk in wisdom, walk in love, walk in light, with redeeming the time because we know that the days are evil. We've learned who we are in Christ Jesus. We've moved now from the incredible marriage relationship, and marriages usually produce children, amen? And so we now move to the parent-child relationship. Now, I know that this may be so familiar to you that you maybe just not intentionally shut me off, but, but don't do that. Every person, whether you have children or not, whether your children are grown, uh, or whether you're getting ready to have a child come into this world, everyone who's listening online, you need God's Word. You need this information because children are precious unto the Lord. Amen? Oh, and how they need to be raised the correct way. So as we move now into the Christian home, this, verses 1 through 4, this is not in the church. Verses 1 through 4 is in your home, in your backyard, okay? And that is vital that you see that because all training with a child should occur in the home. You know, you can't expect the church, don't abdicate your authority to the teachers of the church here. I mean, we've been in a pandemic, we're barely open. But what I'm saying is this, if you expect the church that the kids' church, to train your children. Well, we're here to assist you and love you and love them. But one day a week, one hour a week, is that going to cut it? No. So it's your, you're the one that needs to do this. Now listen, parents, if the both parents, if the mom and the dad, if they, again, if they will not commit their hearts to be obedient to um, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where it says, Be not drunk with, uh, with wine, which is dissipation, but be ye being filled with the Spirit. That ongoing, that's a command now. Lord, fill me every day with your Spirit. I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to be led by the Spirit. I want to be controlled by the Spirit. If we do not, uh, parents, if you don't obey that, that verse, and if you don't obey Ephesians 5.21, where the, the dad and the mother, they submit themselves one to another, and they do so in the fear of the Lord, where the Bible is their instruction manual, not what they may desire, but what God says. If those two verses, just as it was in marriage, if you don't obey them, I'm going to tell you something, parent. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4, they're going to prove to be most difficult in your life. And you're going to find that you will regret... Now, I say this lovingly, not condemning. You'll regret that you didn't do this. You'll regret it if your children grow up without verses 1 through 4. Okay? Does that make sense? That's just so important. And, you know, I know that many today in, this, in 2020, whatever, this crazy time we live in, parenting is a difficult task. And I know that many parents... You know, whether they're believers or unbelievers, they'll go to, you know, the bookstore or order online and Amazon or whatever, you know, because there's a new book on parenting that comes out every week, if you will. And, you know, I'm not going to beat up those books. I don't read those books. I have never read those books. and I'm not condemning anyone who does. However, I will say this, that they don't have the right answers. They may have some answers, but, but God's word is perfect truth. Amen. You know, let me give you a few titles, and uh, not funny titles, but l th these are brand new ones. Here it is. The first one is Guide to Modern, modern Parenting. Now, I, yeah, and every time I read that, I, I say that, I go, what is modern parenting? What does that really mean? Is that different from 10 years ago, you know? And then another one, How to Raise Successful Kids Without Overparenting. Now, that's, that's pretty good. You don't want to be a helicopter mother or father that flies in to rescue your children over every little thing in their life, right? And then here's one. This is really a unique one. It, it, it starts with a question. Want to raise successful kids? Question mark. 
science says, do these five things. I am not going to tell you what those five things are, okay? But that is, re that, I don't even want to go there. However, here's what's amazing. That, you know, you can read 150 pages or 30 chapters in a self-help book on parenting. And God in his incredible wisdom, God who is always perfect, God who never makes a mistake. Mom, dad, listen to me. Future moms and dad, listen to me. He gives you only four verses. That, to me, is unbelievable for one of the most demanding jobs that a mom and a dad can have. Now, listen carefully. I am primarily speaking to fathers this morning, okay? Uh, and so, but mothers, you're, you're right up there with them. But I want to talk to dads, if you don't mind. And, uh, and, and because everything that happens in the training of our children should happen within the Christian home. Amen? And Paul is only talking about Christian homes here. He's not talking about the homes of the lost or whatever. So God tells us in his word that there's only one way to truly bring up your children. And that's his way. The Bible tells us in Psalm 127, verse 3, it says, Behold, the children, our children, are a heritage from the Lord. And that really means that uh, children are, they're a gift from God. Do you, do you believe that your child's a gift from God? Wait till they're 13. You understand? <laughs> but no, I'm teasing. You know I'm teasing. But no, really, they are. They're a gift from God. You, you, and listen to what he says. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Your children are a reward from our Father in heaven. Now, he expects you then to take care of them, to nurture them, to train them, because you have stewardship over them. Amen? So let's begin this morning about uh, the Christian home and what happens there, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, you know that whenever you read that, mom and dad, to your children, it's instant obedience. They, isn't that right? All you have to do is read the living, it's a truth, it's a living word of God. Just read it to them and they look at you and go, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, daddy, I will, is that what happens? No. Now listen, let's look at this historically before, and then we'll bring it up to 2020. Whenever Paul penned this in prison, in Epho I mean in Rome, and writing to the Gentile church at Ephesus, loved one, do you think about what marriage was like or what children were like back then? Did you know that when Paul penned this verse, a Jewish boy was considered a man when he reached the age of 13? 13, hello. 13's not even a good number. You know? No, a girl became a woman at age 12. In the Roman culture at Paul's day, a boy became a man at 14. In the Greek culture, he became a man at 18. In our culture, when do, when do, when do they become a man? I mean, can you imagine, Grant, is, you know, I'm a dad, and this is my 13-year-old daughter. Uh, yes, ma marry this man. He can't make his bed, neither can you. you, you <laughs> do you understand what I'm getting at? Man, it's crazy. I mean, we, we, would you do that today? No, we're, no, this is a 2020. We're all messed up. <laughs> but here's the deal, guys. Now, if you're, a, if you're home with your parents right now, kiddos, and maybe you're there in the living room and listening to the Word of God, listening to me teach, which you should be, okay, here's the deal. Maybe you're a teenager at home, or maybe you're a teenager here. Here's the deal. This is not an option for you. This is a command from the living God. God. He says right here, he says, children, obey your parents in, uh, in the Lord, for this is right. Now, teenagers, let me talk to you. Why do you obey your mother and father? It's very easy. Because they tell you to? Yes, but not really. You obey them because Jesus our Lord commands you to do so. And if you love the Lord, you will obey him. Amen? Yeah, John 14, 15. Jesus said, if, you, if, if whoever loves me you know, will keep my commandments. Well, this is a command from the Lord to all children. He says, listen. He said, you are to obey. You know what the word obey means? It means you listen to your parents you submit to your parents, and then you do what they ask you to do. So you obey because 
this is the Lord tells you to do it, commands you to do it, but it's also because it is right. Did you know that Jesus has never been wrong? And so you obey him. Jesus determines what is right, and Jesus determines what is wrong. He's never, ever made a mistake. So did you know teenagers, little ones, if you're home listening, I don't know if there's any little ones here. Here's the deal. If you disobey mother and father, your mom and dad, you're really disobeying Jesus, the one who loves you, and the one who died for you. And there's something else I want the teenagers and parents to see here. The ultimate authority in verse 1 is not the parent. The ultimate authority is God. Do you see that? Everything centers around our Father in Heaven and our Savior, Lord Jesus. And Jesus is the perfect example for all teenagers and all little ones. Remember when he was 12 years old? And, the, and he and Joseph and Mary, they went into the city for the feast or whatever it was, the Passover celebration. And remember that they left, uh, Mary and them, they left and they were heading back home. But Jesus wasn't with them because Mary thought that he was, Jesus was with some of the other relatives. So after about three days when they couldn't find Jesus, they backtracked, went all back to Jerusalem. And they found Jesus teaching in the temple there or with questions and so forth, you know, with the, with the, with the rabbis and so forth. And, and, and Mary says, son, did you, what's wrong with you? And, he, and I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus said, well, Mom, did you not know that I was to be about my father's business? And so Mary pondered that in her heart and grabbed her son, Jesus, our Lord, 12 years of age. And it says that Jesus submitted unto his parents. Of course, Joseph was not his father. Amen? What a perfect example. The one who created the universe, the one who spoke the worlds in existence, the one who sustains all things, if he can do that, then we can do that too. Amen? Now, look at the second thing a child is to do. We're going to get to the dads in just a moment. It says, honor your father, honor your mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So uh, that is the fifth commandment, by the way, uh, out of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 12. And so God says, here's the command. You're to honor your mom. You're to honor your dad. The word honor means simply to treat them it treat them like treasure. It means to love them. It means to respect them. They love you. They brought you into the world. They're, they protect you. They feed you. They clothe you. And they take care of you. And they you normally sacrifice for you. You know, for a p teenager or a eighth grader, whatever, or a eight-year-old, you know, to disrespect and speak horribly to a mother or father is a terrible thing. And I, I tell you, nothing breaks the heart of, of a mother, mother or father is when children disrespect them. Amen? That's a heartbreaking thing. And not only that, kids, listen to me, it insults God. And you, you just don't want to do that. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 1, a wise son makes a glad father. A foolish son is a grief to his mother. Proverbs 19, 26. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Proverbs 28, 24. Whoever robs his father, whoever robs his mother and says that it is no transgression the same is a companion to the, the, the destroyer. Who is the destroyer? The wicked one, the devil. So listen, parents, I say this to you guys. I love you. I'm old now. I've raised kids. But here's the deal. I say it as a parent to you, and I say it with all the tenderness that I have. How in the world do we truly gain our children's honor today? How do we do that? I mean, do we force them to honor us? Do we beat them into some kind of submission to where you're going to honor me? You see what God said to do? Or we, do we take the Bible? Do we use it as a weapon and, and slap them in the, you know, not really. <laughs> honor me. <laughs> you know, honor your mother. You, we, parents have been, or they, have parents been guilty of that? Yes, they have. Not me, but. No, listen. You have to give your children a mother and a father that they will honor, that they will respect, that they will look up to. 
that, that when they see you both, you're their heroes. Amen? That, that, that's what we have to do. You know, you, you can't um, force your kid to honor you. And you know why? Because you can't, you, you, you can't not teach a child to honor. It has to be something that is, you, they see it and they have to honor you because they understand. And listen, to force a child to do that, loved one, uh, that's not Christianity. Do you understand? That's not the Christian way. No, parents, you know, it doesn't say for your child to love you. The, in those first verses one through four, you're not going to find the word love. You will find God commanding them to obey their mom and dad. You will find God commanding them to to honor their parents but it doesn't say children you know love their parents why because children already love their parents you know it doesn't matter if a parent is a good parent or a bad parent those little ones they love mama and they love daddy amen that, that is so important you know and listen i know that you know i loved my parents and i didn't even know who they were they were never home i i, I never had really a life with them but yet i loved them i don't i know i never honored them and i certainly never obeyed them but it's hard to obey somebody that doesn't teach you to obey them or even is around too you know who cares when you have to run if you if you run wild you just run wild right well, that's the way it was. So, but here's the deal. There's only one way, and there's only one location, actually, in the Bible here that we're talking this morning, to gain your child's honor, and it's in your home. It's in your very own house. Listen, you, whenever you live the Christian life in front of them, every day, 24-7, your home, that, that's, where they, that's where they learn, is right there. And here's the deal. I promise you that kids, you know what they really want about their mama or their daddy? They, they just want them to be real, a real mom and dad, they, not a perfect mother and father. There's no perfect mothers and fathers, amen? They just want you to be genuine and real. And listen, here's the deal. Every mother, every father, you've been given an example. You've been told how to walk. It tells us uh, to, uh, what does it say? It says, imitate God as dear children. That's what you're to do. And walk in love and so forth. And so that's how they see you. And so your walk is so important to them. He says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, does that mean that when a child from his heart they honor their mama, the daddy. Does that mean that God says, now you're going to live to be 100? Is that what that scripture is teaching? No. It, what it's teaching is this, because this, that verse goes all the way back to the children of Israel when they were in the promised land or going to the promised land. No, what this is saying is any child that loves his mom and dad and honors them the right, God's way and obeys God's commandment, God says, you know what? You're pleasing in my sight. And that's what that word literally means. It says in, it says in Deuteronomy 5.16, it says, Honor your father, honor your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may be well with you in the land, meaning the promised land, which the Lord thy God is giving unto you. So, in other words, if a child wants those continued blessings upon him from God, then honor your mother, honor your Father, that's what it's all about. I can tell you with sadness, I, I'm going to tell you the numbers over the years of uh, adults now who were, of course, children, adults, men and women. They come into my office and they say, I know that mama, I know that daddy, they, ra they ra wanted to raise me the right way, but I didn't listen to them. I did not obey them. Remember the word means, obey means to listen or to hear and then submit to what you've heard, okay? Come under authority. And they say, you know, it has cost me dearly. And I've counseled young girls that say, you know what? My mother told me, my daddy, they warned me, they begged me, they prayed with me, they pleaded with me. But I went out, I did have sex. And you know what? Now I have a baby. I'm 16 years old. I don't have a husband. And he does, I don't even know where that guy is anymore. You know, that's, those are sad things, aren't they? It's so vital, you know. And so, so many times I've heard, you know, Mama warned me. 
but I just did not listen. So fathers, it says, do not provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Again, this is done in the home. Now fathers, listen to me. It says, look at it, and you what? Say it. You what? There in the scripture. Fathers. You fathers. Everything starts with you. Everything starts with you. And this is your God-given role in your stewardship. And look at the command. You fathers, and the very first words to parents, it, it's amazing. Not, not about training, but about what you don't do. It says, do not provoke your children. So the first verses here uh, uh, have to do with what comes out of a father or a mother's mouth when he speaks to his child. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. Words hurt, don't they? I mean, man, I mean, you can say things to your child that'll break their heart, cripple them. Words are so important. Words matter. Jesus said every idle word, that word means inoperative word, every idle word that a man speaketh, he shall give an account upon in the day, meaning the day of judgment, the beam of seed of Christ or the great white throne judgment. In other words, an idle word is a word that does not produce life. It doesn't produce blessing. It doesn't encourage. It discourages. It's, he says, listen, there's one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. And that's what a father should do because words can scar. I mean, every person in this room, you've had someone when you were little that said something to you that hurt you deeply. Amen? We've all been there. I mean, you know, maybe you were teased in, in grade school, you know, and, you know, back then we would say four eyes or something. I don't know what they say today. You know, do you all remember those days? You know, whatever, and call you names and so forth. But listen, words can scar. Now listen to me, dads. You have to be careful what you say to your kiddos because they're, they're tender. Their hearts are so tender. They're, they're, they're not old, they're little, you know, and even when they become teens. And the thing is, is the reason that your words are so important is because you, dad, especially a dad, listen to me now, you are the most important person in the life of your child. They look at you. You are usually their hero, okay? And here's the deal. They believe what you say. They believe what you say. They believe it in, 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 with all of their heart. That is so important. You know, I remember I got in trouble. Now, I didn't know my dad that well the last year of his life. And I was already, well, matter of fact, I was, I was only 12 years old. And I got thrown in jail in Arkansas, and I'm not going to tell you why. But I spent three months there as a 12-year-old boy. And they fed me one meal a day, and that's the honest God truth. That was the worst experience of my life, and I have never been in jail since. I learned. But I didn't know my dad, and somehow, you know, I guess the police, they told him, uh, that he lived in Fort Worth and they said, your son's in jail, da, 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 da. I will never forget sitting in that jail cell and my father walked in. I had not seen him in so long. He looked at me and he said, here's what he said, you are an embarrassment to me. He said, do you know how much money I'm losing in my business to be here today? And he turned around and he walked out. I was 12 years old, and I was in there, and it wasn't even my fault. You see what I'm saying? Do you know how, how it took me years to get over that? I mean, even though, I, I mean, he could have said, I love you, son. What in the world happened? How in the world did you end up here? None of that. Just made me feel that way, and then he walked away. I'll never forget the walking away. That hurt more than anything else. Here's the deal, fathers. You are so powerful, and what you say to your child matters. Listen, the Bible tells us that life and death is in the power of the, the tongue. You speak good words over your children, loved ones. Speak wonderful words over them. Listen, this command is from God. It says in Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not provoke your children. Don't nag them and nag them and nag them. He says, because they, they become discouraged. 
So your words are either going to encourage your, your children or they're going to discourage them. To demean your child verbally is sin. Amen? Sin. Love doesn't do that. Love corrects, but love doesn't demean. Amen? Love sweeps. Uh, it doesn't sweep sin under the cart, but it covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Yes, they're, they're just little children. It says, fathers, here's what you're to do now. Don't, make your, don't drive your kids crazy and discourage them and all the rest of it. But bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up. That means literally that, word, that phrase, nourish your children to maturity. Bring, in other words, prepare them from infancy till the day they leave home, if they marry, go to college, whatever. Train them up. Nourish them and, and protect them. And you do so, it says, in the Lord. It says that training. Now, we all know what that word means, most parents. It means discipline. We all know that we need to discipline our children. Amen? I'm sure that every family member, they have all the scriptures on smacking their kids or whatnot written down, you know, and, or maybe there used to be a paddle hanging in the nursery, I think, back there. It says, I need thee every hour. I don't know. You know what I mean? I mean, that was years ago, but uh, now, now we just use a stun gun. But... Uh, <laughs> No, we bring them up, we nourish them to maturity, training, discipline. That's what it means. Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares his rod, meaning parents, you hate your kid, you hate your son, but he who loves him, here it comes, disciplines him promptly. Uh, or that word promptly means early. You begin to train your children from the moment of birth. You don't wait till they're 17, amen? That's what that word means. Here's a favorite scripture of mine, Proverbs 30, 17. The eye that mocks his father and scorns ob uh, obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out. And the young eagles will eat it, meaning eat your eyes. That's one of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> when Thomas was a little boy, we had that stenciled in his bedroom and it, it glowed in the dark. No, you know I'm teasing. So here, here it is. Listen, the main thing is not spanking. That, that, that's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with disciplining your child. Never discipline your child in anger, of course. That's horrible. But, you know, the thing is, it's not really about spanking, fathers. It's about speaking. Do you know there's more scriptures about speaking, instructing your child, than there is spanking and disciplining your children? See, and that's where we, we make a, a big mistake and so forth. You know, you know, that word admonition there, look at it. That word means to instruct and encourage. It literally means to put something into their mind. And as one expositor says, it means training by the word. Well, whose word? the Word of God, and everything centers around the Lord. So here's the deal. You know this, I know this, I'm not going to give you any big revelation that you don't know, but fathers, listen to me. Your child, when they come into the world, they, do they come into the world knowing right and wrong? No. Do they um, automatically quote the Ten Commandments from, from the crib? No. Do they know anything about Jesus? the Holy Spirit, God the Father, or the, or the Word of God. No, they, their mind is empty, and God says, now you're going to fill their mind, you're going to fill their heart, and you're going to do it my way because that's what your child needs. So they come into this life, every, every child that comes into the life, they don't know that there's a devil out there, do they? No, they don't have a clue. They don't, I mean, they don't lay there in the crib at night, you know, after they've nursed for five hours and go, oh, there's a devil out there. He comes to kill still. They, they don't do that. They don't have a clue about that. Listen, they are not prepared for real life. They're not prepared. And they're not prepared when they're three years old or five years old or 13 years old. They're not prepared. You, dads, you must prepare your children for real life. Today, our kids grow up, they're sexting, there's, it's all kinds of junk on the internet. Listen, do you know that children today by the age of eight have already been exposed to pornography? Think about that. 
I'm just not talking about boys. I'm talking about girls. All, all children love one. Listen, no, we want to instruct our children, prepare our children. Well, they don't realize when they're born and as they grow up that every day, when they do grow up, every day of their life, they're going to be faced with temptations. They're going to be faced with the evil that's in this world. And you know what? You want them to stop looking at the iPhone and, stop and start looking to the Lord. Amen? Yes, that's so, that's so important. Now, listen, to be raised... In a Christian home is one of the greatest privileges that a child can have. I don't know. I often think sometimes when I look back, what would have happened to me had I been raised with a godly family, a godly mother, a godly father? I mean, think about that. I never saw a Bible. I never heard a prayer. I didn't, and I didn't even know anything about God. You know what I'm saying? And I, I just think of the privilege to, be, to, be, to come home from school or to, to cr play in the backyard, but come into a house where Jesus is loved, where Jesus is honored, where the Bible is not only believed, but is truly read Do you, and studied. Do you understand? To come into a home and say, you know what, my mommy, my daddy, I come into my house, but they are going to train me, and they're going to train me up in the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're giving me the truth of God's Word. To know that you're talking about creating a security in your child. That's so vital. Now listen, fathers, here's the deal. This is not an option, suggestion. This is a must. Every father, now if you're, a, if you're a father raising single children, maybe you're a mother raising children, okay? Single mom. It doesn't matter. Here's the deal. Every parent must give their children a biblical worldview. You have to do that. That's just not an option today. That's your stewardship, and it takes place in the home. And here's the deal. When you give your child a biblical worldview, you can, dads, and we can be guilty of this now, you cannot base that on your personal preferences. I'm giving you a biblical worldview. Let me tell you what's really going on. It's what my dad taught me, my granddad. Taught. No, 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 listen. You give your child a biblical view, not according to your personal preferences, but according to the spiritual truths found in the word of God. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and it's the truth that will set you free. Amen? Amen? And there's something else, and I made this mistake early, but then I corrected it. This is so vital. See, when I was giving my son a biblical worldview from the very moment that boy was born, believe me, I'm telling you that my goal was wrong. See, my goal was parental authority in the beginning. Then I kept, and then I realized I was making a grave mistake because, you know, I'm teaching now you're to obey me and I, I'm in authority. You follow what I'm getting at. But I made a mistake. It's not parental authority. It's teaching them who is truly in authority. And that's God. And that you say, uh, when you spank your child, for example, which I hope you don't do, but you, I mean, not that I'm against that, but the thing is, you know, that's, that's it, it, it hurts to spank your kids. Come on. I mean, there's no, and no, there's no parent goes, I can't wait for this. Come on. No, it hurts you. And you know, you have to always say to your children, say, I'll tell you why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I don't want to do this. But you've rebelled. I've given you the boundaries over and over and over. And you've broke these boundaries over and over. And I love you with all my heart, but I love God more. He's the one in authority. And the reason that I'm getting there to give you a swat is because I'm going to be obedient to the Lord and it's going to break my heart when you cry. Do you understand me? Yes. See, that, it's not about us. It's about doing, we have to be obedient to the Lord as well. And here's the problem. You've heard me say it, I know, all, after all these years. Dads, listen to me, fathers. If you don't give your child a biblical worldview, if you don't teach them, if you don't train them, if you don't... Be there for them the way God wants you to be there for them. Someone else will be. And there's not a parent that's listening. You don't want anyone else but you to tell you or to tell your children how to make right decisions, how to make right choices in this life. Amen? Well, if you don't, the Internet will tell them. Do you understand? All they have to do is just Google whatever. Schools will tell them. Their peers will tell them. No, you, you want to tell them. You want, you know, 
the, the the world that we live in only has one voice, and they're all uh, in unity. And it is this, the world wants to conform your children. Tra and not transform them, conform them, squeeze them into the world, uh, the mold of the world. The devil, he wants to deceive them and destroy them. You know, many years ago, I, I read a quote, and I've used it for, uh, in this church now for nearly 30 years. It's a, one of the, it's a great quote. It was written by Richard Baxter concerning fathers and their children, and it was written in the 1600s. And he says this. He says, if you don't teach your children, well, you sell them to the world. What a word is that? He said, you're selling your kids to the world. He says, you betray your children to the devil. You allow them to become slaves of Satan. You allow Satan to abuse them in this life and then torment them in the next. What a word is that? Listen, guys, you know, the joy of a child coming into the world. From birth uh, to, the, to 18, you know how many days is that? A little over 6,700 days. That means you have 6,700 opportunities to teach your kid from birth to the day they're 18. If they're 12 years old right now, and you say, man, I got to start teaching my kiddo right now. Well, you know what? You only have, what, how many days? Let me look, 2,100, 2,190 days if they're 12 years old until they turn 18. It says, fathers, you have to do something. You have to bring them up, number one. Number two, you bring them up in the training and number three, you bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. And all three of those divine truths are done in your home. Done in the church, in your home. So you nurture them to maturity. Body, mind, soul, spirit, whatever it might be doing. You know, my question is, during this pandemic, fathers, did you, every day, did you, did you train your kids? I know that you go to work, so did I. You know, come on. We have a responsibility. See, fathers, if you're going to tra tra train up your children, you know, you don't say, okay, go pray, do you? No, you say, come with me, and I want to teach you to pray. They see how daddy prays or how mama prays and, and so forth. And, you know, you teach them to pray. And it's so great, you know, to, to use, uh, it's so easy to do this, to tr train up your children. You don't have to have a, a theological degree or any of those things. You just have to be a mom. You have to be a dad. You have to love the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to know the Word of God. You know, it's so easy. You can just use daily life experiences with your children. You know, when Thomas was a little boy, he would go out and play, man, and uh, at our first pastorate, we had a big uh, area in our yard where it was like a sand pit. You know, he would, he would be, I mean, his, in his ears was dirt. His face was dirt. Dirt ring around his neck. He's filthy. And, and, you know, about every day he fell, you know, and he would wound himself. And you know how kids are. They think they're dying because there's a little blood. And, and so if I was uh, not at the church and if I was home, he would all, Daddy, Daddy. And I'd run outside and I'd put him in my lap, you know. And, and he said, oh, look, am I, am I going to live? And, you know, kids are very dramatic, like their mothers. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. That must have been the Spirit of God. Anyway, so... And I always used it. Now, listen, I used it as a teaching experience. It's, just, it's so easy to do this. So there the big old tears are coming down his face. And so he's sitting on my knee and I'm looking at his, I mean, sitting on my knee and I'm looking at his knee and I'm going, son, I said, you, you better quit crying now. Oh, daddy, I can't look. You know, I said, yeah, but the bottle that God has for all your tears, I said, it's nearly full. And I said, he can't keep writing. Okay. Well, see, what was I doing? I was teaching him, wasn't I? I was teaching him that God has a bottle. And that bottle, every tear he has ever cried, God has. And that God has a book of remembrance, and he writes down what every tear that fell from his eyes meant. See, you're teaching your children. And you know what's so fun? Guys, dads, listen to me. Mothers too, but I'm talking to dads right now. You can make it so much fun to teach your children, especially, I love it when they're little. You can teach them the Word of God. You know, for example, the things that I did, I would tease with Thomas or whatnot, and I'd say, I said, do you think you can, uh, how would you like to lay your head on, on a, instead of a pillow, like I tuck him in at night? i say, how would you like for me to bring a big old stone in here and, you, and put your head on it? 
He said, Dad, that's crazy. I said, did you know that's in the Bible? Did you know there was a man that, that when he went to bed that night, instead of having a pillow, he had a big stone and he still put his head upon it. Do you see what I'm getting at? You see, or about, remember the axe that swam there in the swim or whatever in the water? I said, do you believe an axe head can really uh, come on? Do you know that there, there was a time that the sun, God actually made the sun stand still? You see what I'm, you see what I mean? All those things are in the Bible. And man, one of the things that was always good, I said, do you believe that it's possible for a man to have 12 fingers and 12 toes? Well, that's in the Word of God, isn't it? Do you see how easy that is to teach your little one? Yeah, or when the sun comes up, you can talk about how God made it, or, or the stars of the moon. All those things, they're just tools for you, and, and so forth. I remember one time I told the, some kids at I Am Terrell. You know, remember when we had the kids' church at I Am Terrell? And I, I said, how many people in here believe that there was a man and he walked on this earth for three years without any clothes on? You're, you're stupid. I, nobody. Oh, I, so then I open up the Bible and I start teaching it right there. One of my favorite things to tell little ones, here it is. This is my favorite one. It, it says, a woman who boiled and ate her son. That, that's not my favorite. Come on, I'm just joking. Never mind. <laughs> that's when you want to get your kids. You better straighten up. No. <laughs> but that is in the Bible. Listen, dads, teach them how much Jesus loves them. Teach your children how to be led by the Spirit, how to walk in the Spirit. Teach them about grace. Teach them about forgiveness. Teach them about heaven and hell. Teach them about the devil. Teach them about how to put on the armor of God. So easy to teach a little one that, how you take the pieces and, and so forth. But the main thing you want to teach them is this, that God cannot lie, and he'll never lie, and his word is always truth. It's absolute perfect truth, and he'll never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. Amen? And let me tell you what you need to teach your teenagers. Very important. You need dads, mothers, you need to tell your teens when they move into the teenage years. It's not a sin. It's not a sin to feel certain desires or be ashamed of those desires. But what you need to do is show them how to control those desires. Do you understand? Don't make things filthy or dirty. Don't make God, God created marriage, God created sex. Are you listening to me? Don't make things dirty that God's created. No, teach them how to control. Teach them that the Bible is the authority, always the authority. Not, not, not their schools and schools, praise the Lord. Not their teachers, but praise the Lord for teaching. Not the government, not their friends. No, you teach them that God's word is the authority. Therefore, when they move into whenever it's being taught in grade school or middle school or high school or college, and they start talking about, you know, teaching evolution as a fact instead of the theory, they can go, I'm, I'm not a, I, I didn't, I'm not a, I'm not a bug. No, I, no, I'm created in the image of God. Amen? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah, do you understand? Or when the, they start teaching in the science class about the Big Bang Theory and how the, it, just, it just exploded and there we are. And you know, you know, and you say they know Genesis chapter 1 and following that God created everything. Amen? And then they'll know that it's not the Big Bang, it, it, bang Theory, it's the Big Bull Theory. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, they, they need to know that. See, this takes place in the home. In the home. This is your responsibility, dads. Now, and they will believe you. That's what's so wonderful, especially when they're little. And, they're, and that's what you want. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, he says, oh, Timothy, you know, from, <clears throat> pardon me, childhood, from childhood, in other words, since you've been a little infant, <clears throat> he said, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for thou, through thou, salvation, <clears throat> which is in Christ Jesus. That's a true word. The word of God, spoon feeding the word of God to your children. How wonderful is that? You know, and listen, I say this very tenderly again, but I see so much of it today.
It's one thing to shelter our little ones and, and keep them away from everything in the world, and I understand all that, but you don't want to raise a bunch of little religious hypocrites, amen? To where they look down their nose at everyone if they see somebody doing wrong that they're better than they are you know or they look down their noses at those that are lost you need to teach them how jesus's heart is broken for the lost and that your heart is broken for the lost as well you need to teach them what sin is what sin does and where sin will finally lead and that is eternal death you need to teach them all those things now listen dads what you do <clears throat> what you do in the home is the best teacher and it's so easy your children grow up from infancy to whatever and every time you sit at the dinner table the breakfast table the lunch table they know that their father or if you're a single parent right a single mother whatever uh, uh, raising children here's the deal they know that we're going to pray over our food they learn they see see you you're teaching them and training them the whole time they would never ever even today, look at me how old I am. I, can, I, I cannot sit down and eat unless I ask God to bless my food. Do you understand? I can't do that. I, can't, I just can't do it. Why? For we're to give thanks unto the Lord. This was my provision. This is every, and, the, and these children, they, they learn that. You see, whenever a father, they observe their dad, especially little girls. They watch their dad because their dad is the hero. They look up to him. He can do no wrong. See, they watch and they observe the father, especially the way the father interacts and loves the mother. I promise you guys, listen to me. You want to treat your wife well, like treasure. We learned that, remember? And when they see that, they're going to say as they grow up, they're going to say, I want my husband to treat me like my daddy treated my mother. Do you understand how important that is? Why? You're, because all their lives, from the time they're born till they leave, you are teaching them, you are training them because they are observing you. You are modeling your behavior to them. Here's the deal. If you are judgmental, guess what? You're modeling that behavior, and they're going to be judgmental just like you. Very, very important. Behavioral modeling is the best way and the most important way to really raise your children and to train them in the admonition of the Lord. See, you are your children's model for everything in a sense. You're your children's model for prayer. You know, for, you're, their, you're the, the model to your children for forgiving others, for helping others, for loving others. Amen? All of those things. The dad, you are the model, for example, about not forsaking the assemblies of yourselves together, which means church attendance. If you don't think church is important or if you think church is maybe every other six weeks or whatever, you know, or I'm going to, cowboys or have more preeminent, you know, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Well, what is that teaching your kids? Whenever you say, dads, well, honey, make sure those kids get in Sunday school. I, I, I got to watch this game. You know how important it is to me. Now, I'm not beating you up about that. I don't even care about the Cowboys. But I do care about another team, but that's my business. No, listen, you're their model. See, your kids come to school and they're taught that prayer is important, Bible study is important, honoring your mom and dad is important, and being in church is important. So if you don't do that as a father, then all of a sudden they get confused because you're not modeling that at home. And they, they, they just can't put together. So they hear it taught, but they just don't see it modeled. Do you see how important a father is, a mother is? Listen, what happens when your children are not being given, in a Christian home, are not being given a true biblical worldview? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 131, it says, Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own and filled to the full, I'm sorry, with their own fancies. There's no parent that wants that. Man, you, you, you want your children to be protected. See, without a biblical worldview, without God's word, I mean, it's hard to find a moral compass, isn't it? It's, uh, it's hard to find direction in which way you go in this life. Pew Research said this about a biblical worldview. Pew Research said only 4% of millennials have a Christian biblical worldview. 
Now, now we're in what's called, I think, Generation Z, okay? Generation Z, according to Barna Research, is, it says this. Generation Z is the least Christian generation in American history. Think of that. Man. And I know that they are certainly not being given a biblical worldview. Matter of fact, one scholar says this, a person's worldview, whether it's Christian or non-Christian, a person's worldview is developed between the ages of 18 months and 13 years. You know, I encourage every parent that your home, that, listen, that you make Christianity, being a Christian, the most joyous thing in the world. Amen? And that it's, it's not, so, you know, it's not like, you know, I, I can't smile or, you know, hello. No, man, being a Christian is the greatest privilege in the, in the world. And, 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 and so forth. So we have to ask ourselves, every parent, my kids, here I am, I'm training them. But can I tell a difference between my child and the way, uh, the way he acts, she acts, and the way that uh, uh, children act in the world? You know what I mean? That's a good indicator if you're training them or if you're not. Every Christian parent has a promise from God. You remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaching his very first message there uh, on, the, on the day the church was birthed. And, and there in the upper room, all of those people were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues and so forth. And, it, and, and they asked Peter, what in the world does this mean? And he tells everyone that's there, he says, man, this is every children's birthright. This is every parent's birthright, right? He says, listen to this promise, Acts 2.39. And the pro for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, <clears throat> as many as the Lord our God will call. The endowment of power from upon high. It's one thing to be saved and sealed with the Spirit. It's another to be endued with power. Amen? It's so important. The reason we need to have the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us is because we are powerless to live the Christian life without it. Every child. You know how easy it is for your child to be filled with the Spirit when they're little? It's so easy. Listen, do you know your home should be where supernatural things happen? That was one of the great privileges that I had uh, in this church was that we started, of course, uh, the, this church in the living room of our home. I still have the, the same couch that we all started on, or the, the, the people. And uh, matter of fact, Danny and Paula, you're sitting here right now. I remember before we ever went to the church, remember? There you guys were at the house. Now, all those years ago, and it was so wonderful for Thomas, you know, as he was old enough then, you know, and for everybody to see the supernatural things that happened in a home. We had so many wonderful moves of God, the Holy Spirit moving. I mean, we had the Holy Spirit come into the house one night. There was about 20 of us in there worshiping the Lord. But it's, it's fun to worship the Lord in your house. It's fun to just lift your hands up to the Lord and praise Him. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to my heart. And uh, I, I'll never forget, I was by the fireplace, and there we, we were all standing up worshiping the Lord. And I said, guys, you're going to think I'm crazy, but you know what? I, the Lord, I believe, just spoke to me, and he said, the Holy Spirit is getting ready to move through this house. Man, when I said that, I'm telling you what, everybody's hands, the Spirit of God moved into that place where people were speaking in other languages and so forth. It was, we were moving. And then one woman, I'll never forget, she started screaming and ran out of the house and got in her car and left. <laughs> Bye. No. <laughs> See, children are so, they never forget those days. We, we were in a church service, and, and Thomas was in the kids' church, and it was and years ago. And, and uh, listen, talking about the Holy Spirit of God, the promise that's due to all of us. And, and uh, Thomas, on the way home, he says, Daddy, can I talk to you? And he's in the back seat, Mom and I are in the front. And we would always stop at the church, and we would get a, a, one of those, like, a, I don't know, some kind of slurpy. I don't know what it was called. God forbid that anyone would ever do that now. But anyway, uh, and he says, you know, something it was strange in the kids' church. I said, well, why is it? He said, well, we were waiting on the teacher to start teaching and, and said, you know, we were all in there and we were just talking and then it got very quiet. He said, and then, Daddy, I, I felt a, a wind 
blow into the kids' church. And I mean, it, I felt it blowing all over me. And he said, then something happened. I said, well, what happened? He said, I started speaking in a language, and I don't know what happened. Loved one, listen to me. Listen to me. Do you understand? And then you have the privilege of explaining what just happened, teaching him from the word of God. Listen, we are a supernatural people, and we are filled with a supernatural a power from up on high. Amen? Oh, listen how we need that desperately. You remember when the disciples, when the children started coming to Jesus in Luke 18, 15? It, it, it tells us, it says, it says, and then the disciples also brought infants, little tiny babies to Jesus that he just might just touch them. And when he saw, when the disciples saw it, well, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, listen, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. Now listen why. For such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, whoever does not receive me, Jesus, whoever does not believe in me, receive the kingdom of God as a little child, as a little, a little three-year-old, four-year-old child, will by no means enter in it. You know what's so, what I love about children? It's so easy, so easy. Their so, the hearts are so tender. It's so easy to lead them to the Lord. Do you understand? It's, it's not hard. You know, and that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying the only possible way to enter the kingdom of God, he said, is to receive salvation as a free gift. Just as a free gift. Just like, you know, just like a child accepts a gift. I'm going to tell you something. A, a child is never too proud to receive a gift. <laughs> you know, do you understand me? No, not at all. Listen, fathers and mothers, listen to me. Your child, no matter older or younger, they see Jesus in you. If you're walking with the Lord, they see Jesus in you. And they see Jesus modeled in you. And you know what they want? They want what you have. One night, when Thomas was, I think, six years old, I don't remember exactly what age. I have it written in my book at home. But uh, I would pray with him. Of course, every morning I'd pray with him. And then and when I got home, I would pray with him at night to tuck him in. And uh, we would talk a little bit. Then we'd pray about if there's anything on his heart. You know how little kids are. And, you know, you got to pray my wagon's not working. You know what I mean, stuff like that. And so... As I prayed with him, I was getting ready to leave the room, and he says, Daddy, can I ask you one more question? I said, sure, son, what's wrong? What's going on? He said, he says, I, 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 want, I want what, what's in you. I said, what do you mean? He says, I want the Jesus in you and me. I said, well, here's what we do. Let's ask him to come into your heart. You see how easy that is? It, oh, and then, of course, he, there he was. He was born again. Listen, it all starts in the Christian home. All of it. Now, I'm going to read a quote that I didn't read in the first service. This person says, The greatest source of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips but deny him by their lifestyles. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Loved one, listen. We are, we're the light of the world. Amen? We're the salt of the earth. Go, when you get home, read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. And you know what you're going to find? When God told the children of Israel, when they got ready to go into the promised land, he says, okay, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to, parents, mothers, fathers, dads, you're going to have to teach your children diligently. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to show them who I am. And that's what we have to do today. And it's not hard to teach your children. It really is the easiest thing in the world if you'll just do it. But you have to do it every day. Every day. And never forget that you are their model. Father, I thank you for your word.
I thank you, Lord, when these four verses, we find victory in training our children and loving our children and, Lord, making them productive believers in this world, turning them, Lord, from little children into, the, into Lord, warriors for the living God, creating, Lord, an unshakable children in this wicked, fallen world that we live in. I pray over every mom, every dad, every grandfather, grandmother, or Lord, over every upcoming marriage and children. I pray over them. May their homes be flooded with your spirit, with your love, with your goodness. And may every father have an urgency and every mother have an urgency to give their children an ongoing, continuous, biblical world view to equip them for this life. And we love you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Let's stand.